chapter 15, and this is part two of Reconstruction. We're looking at the 12 years or so uh, after the Civil War, this idea of reconstructing the, the country, uh, especially the South after the Civil War, what to do with all the freed slaves and integrating all these states back into the Union that had left. So we left off with women being angered about black men, former slaves getting the vote, but they didn't get the vote. Uh, and these women lobbied to add one word to the 15th Amendment. What would that word be? Sex or gender, perhaps, would be a better description or better word to use. So they wanted the 15th Amendment to say, regardless of race, color, sex, or previous servitude. So include women also. Uh, and Stanton said women could, could avail them, ourselves of the strong arm and the blue uniform of the black soldier to walk in by his side. So this is a somewhat of an odd show of support from white women for black men that you didn't really see in the, in this era. Uh, but she but she's saying, don't just give it to them. It's a glorious moment for them, but make it a glorious moment for all of us and give women the vote also. Uh, that that way everybody can vote as long as you're a certain age and you're a citizen and so on. But when we were accused of being selfish at a glorious moment in time. Uh, Frederick Douglass pleaded with women to let the black male take priority. Don't ruin the moment. And he continues, when women, because they are women, are hunted down, dragged from their homes, and hung upon lampposts, then they will have an urgency to obtain the ballot equal to our own. Uh, he's saying, please, don't, don't make it about you. This is something that's been going on for a long time. We've been abused and 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 you know beaten and and whipped and and hung and those things aren't happening to you so so don't don't ruin the moment uh stanton responds with the hugely racist statement ridiculing freedmen and immigrants by calling them patrick and sambo and hans and ung tong you're going to give these people the vote but disallow the vote for women so of course these are these are you know racist names here. Patrick would be Irish, which were considered to be the lowest of the low in those days. Sambo would be would be blacks. Hans would be German. Ong Tong would be Asian. You're going to give it to all these people, but not to us. Uh, so they they weren't successful here, and, and the women's movement split over this. And and two organizations of women were founded out of the split. Uh, the American Woman Suffrage Association was led by Lucy Stone, and they remained loyal to the Republican Party, even though they were disallowed to vote. Uh, and they stood opposed to the to the second association, uh, Stanton's and Susan B. Anthony's National Woman Suffragette Association. Uh, this association was more radical, and they turned away from the Republican Party and said, "We're done with you." And they focused on women's rights in general, not just the vote. Uh, in this era, women were subject to the fortunes of their husbands. They were not encouraged to go to college. They, they were told to stay home, raise kids, maintain a home. They could not own property. And, and their husband's estate would go to their oldest son, not them. They were not allowed to be involved in politics. So besides the vote, you had a lot of issues going on in the, in the world of women. Uh, so, so Stanton and Anthony's group, the NWSA, they, they challenged the 15th Amendment uh, by registering to vote as women. And they, and they cite the 14th Amendment as their right to do so. And they claim that being turned away from registering to vote violated the 14th Amendment, which, of course, gave people the, the rights of citizenship. And surely, if a, if a citizen has the rights to citizenship, that must mean the right to vote. So, so women are trying to push this idea. Go register to vote and see what happens. And if you get arrested, that's all right, because now we can take it into the courts. And then this is what happens. You have uh, Minor versus Happer set. So Virginia Minor uh, is a woman of, of Stanton's group. She tries to register to vote, uh, but, but Happer set won't let her. Reese Happer set won't let her. So she took Reese Happer set to court. Uh, so she's barred from registering to vote in St. Louis on the basis of the law that restricted the right of suffrage to just men. It should be women also. <clears throat> so so Minor uh, claimed that she had been denied one of the privileges and immunities of citizenship 
as guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. So this goes all the way to the Supreme Court. But the Supreme Court ruled that the enfranchisement or, or the right to vote of male citizens only was not necessarily a violation of the citizenship rights of women. So, of course, you know, a, an unusual uh, decision, if you look at it, surely citizenship means the right to vote, but not if you're a woman. <clears throat> so this, the, the Supreme Court squashed any hope they had and denied women the vote. Uh, so when did women finally get the vote? Not until 1920, nearly 50 years later, in the 19th Amendment, will they finally get the right to vote. <clears throat> Okay, changing directions here. So, so what happened to these slaves at the end of the war? Where did they go? And I mentioned this a couple of times. One day you're, you're enslaved, the next day you're free, but nothing's changed. So where do I go? Do I walk down the street? Do I, you know, what's down the street? I've never been down the street before. Where, where do we go? Again, no welcoming committee to say, come on over here. Here's some soup. Sit down. We're going to get you a job. We're going to help you. No, this, it's the next day, but now we're free. So what, what do you think the most popular uh, thing to do was once these people were free? Uh, so remember, years of slavery, years of family being sold away. So the first thing that many did was go in search of their family members because they really weren't typically very far away, it, it, except for the case of being sold down the river, which happens towards the end of, the, of this era, in the antebellum era. But most times they were sold to a plantation next to them or down the road. They, they're only a few miles away, but you never see them. So they, they go out to find these, these family members, children, spouses, parents, cousins, to, to reunite. Of course, they also want voting rights because without those, you have no power. We, we will have no say in anything, and these people are going to crush us. We need to have uh, the vote. We also want to build communities and start, start their lives. Uh, you know, how do we do that? We don't even have a last name. Slaves did not have last names. They typically had a like a pet name, so like like you know, uh, Molly and Sunny, Cinder, Polly, Cuffy, Winnie, Cumby. That that was their only name. So, in order to integrate into a white society, many use their former master's last name, uh, and this is how they got names. So instead of just being uh, Winnie, you are now Winnie Smith or Winnie Jones or whatever your master's name was because that was the only name they knew. Um, some of them took names of famous people like Jefferson, Washington, uh, Adams, and, and, and so on. Uh, so I'm going to show you an image of a person. You tell me who you think this is. Does anyone know who that is? This is a famous football player. It's been a, number, a few years now, but very famous uh, played for the Chargers for, for a long time, LaDainian Tomlinson, uh, one, of the, one of the more popular, famous Chargers over, over the years. Uh, so LaDainian grew up very poor as sh part of a sharecropping family in Texas, grew up in poverty. But he, was, uh, he had an athletic skill, and as he grew up, he became more adept as an athlete, and long story short, became a college athlete went to Texas Christian University as a running back for football. And he, he was a runner-up for the Heisman Trophy, which is the, the best college player in the country for that year. Uh, where, where, where he grew up when he was young, uh, it was called Tomlinson Hill, and you have this sign up there. And he asked his mother, you know, why is this named after us? Like, that's our name. Yeah, your grandfather was integral in, in the in the uh, formation of this community, so they named it after him. So he grew up all those years thinking that, okay, that's kind of cool. This 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 area is named after my grandfather, uh, and and he goes on to become a a, a first round draft choice um, for the San Diego Chargers, uh, multi millionaire, you know, and he has this great career, and he's you know one of the top running backs really ever. Uh, while in the midst of his career, a man named Chris Tomlinson contacts him. Same last name, but a white man. Chris Tomlinson contacts him and says, next time you're in Texas, LT, Ladanian, they called him LT, would you come and see me? I want to talk to you about something. So, of course, like, like most black men, even if you are a famous football player that's a multimillionaire and, and loved by many, uh, you know, this is... 
you know, what does this white man want with me? Why is he, why is this man contacting me? He was a little unsure about, about who he was and what he wanted, but he decided to go along with it. And next time he was in Texas, Ladanian and Chris Tomlinson got together and met. And Chris was telling Ladanian about a book he was writing called Tomlinson Hill, the same name on that sign. This book is the remarkable story of two families who shared the Tomlinson name, one white, one black. So perhaps starting to get the idea here. Uh, Chris Tomlinson tells the story that my ancestors owned this plantation <clears throat> called Tomlinson Hill. It was right here. We're, we're on the land right now. That old sign is the sign for the old plantation. And my family owned it and we were slave owners. Ladani and your family, your your ancestors, were the slaves that were on this land. So here's an example of somebody famous that we, that we know um, taking on the name of your master moving forward. So when Ladanian's family was freed, they went out into the world or did what they what they were going to do, and they took the last name of Tomlinson. So of course, did. Ladanian's not happy. Like, well, wait a minute. Like, so, so all of a sudden, my name that I've had all my life is is the actual name of my my people's former master's name. And he wasn't too happy about that. Uh, you know, and this whole this whole idea of Thomas and Hill, of course, takes a different meaning. This has got nothing to do with his grandfather. Uh, and and he was upset and a little depressed about this at first, but as time went on. He, he somewhat spun it into a positive and, and kind of used it as a social platform to, to speak out about racism and exclusion and the, the differences in American society today. Uh, so this, this story is a little bit of these two men, same last name, one black, one white, you know, you, you uh, uh, coming together. And this is what Martin Luther King always preached. He, Hope that one day the, the families of slave owners and slaves come together in unity. So they, they, they somewhat do that here, okay? Um, as Ladanian's career came to an end, he retired. You, you then have to wait five years, and then you can be voted into the Hall of Fame, which is very prestigious as a, as a pro football player. If you were voted in on the first ballot, that's even better. And, and Ladanian was voted in on his first ballot. Uh, of course, when you enter the Hall of Fame at the start of the football season, the NFL season, they have a ceremony where they each of the Hall of Famers, the new Hall of Famers, get up and say a speech. And they're typically speeches about thanking all their family, friends, coaches, players, organizations that help them along their way, you know, people that help them gain to, to get to this point. But on occasion, a player will use it as a platform to make a statement, whether it's political or social. And Ladanian does that here. He makes a social statement that's very stirring and inspiring, emotional. Uh, so he takes this negative of his past and spins it into a positive. So I want you to go to the next, to our first film for this section anyway, and watch the film Ladanian Tomlinson NFL HOF 2017 speech. Understand that you're seeing just the last, you know, part of the speech. These speech, these speeches can go on for 15, 20 minutes. So he spent all the time talking about all the, all this football stuff already. We're not going to look at that. We're going to look at his point of view about his slave name and his slave past. So go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so you know he he spins it in a positive fashion and makes a stirring and emotional plea to to America. Because I understand the NFL is one of the most popular sports out there. And, you know, literally millions and millions of Americans are watching this. He makes a statement to try to affect change. Uh, so as this war ended, going back to our era, uh, and uh, Sherman did Sherman's march and, and marched across uh, Georgia and, and just burned to the ground. Uh, everywhere he went and conquered, the slaves there were free. And where do they go? They followed, they followed his army. And Sherman promised them that, that we will give you 40 acres and a mule when this war is over. So that's not a huge amount of land uh, you know, anymore, but it's a, it's a start. And of course, a mule to, to do what? Pull your plow. So you'll have land and a mule to get on your feet and make a living. 
we're going to give that to you when this war is over. But this never comes to fruition. In fact, Lincoln gets very angry at Sherman for promising that. You can't promise that. Where's all this land going to come from? And this idea that we'll take the, we'll take the old plantations and, and, and divvy them up into small portions for each slave. Uh, so it's interesting. 40 acres and a mule today is seen as a derogatory idea and a, and a broken promise by, by, you know, white America to help these slaves when, after they were free, they, they said that they would do it, but it never happened. So of course it's, it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a, of an insult today. So if you know who Spike Lee is, his production company is called 40 acres and a mule, kind of a, a you know, a little bit of a jab at white America for, for not following through with your promise. Uh, but it was, it was Thaddeus Stevens, one of those, one of the re radical Republican leaders. It was his idea to, uh, he suggested that the plantations be split up into smaller parcels and given to all the former slaves. So, I mean, it sounds good from our lens today because we know that slavery is an awful thing and it's, you know, against humanity, it's immoral. But in those days, you know, these plantations were very opulent, very, you know, uh, these were wealthy people. Yes, they gained all their money from slave labor, but these plantations were handed down for generations. And, you know, this was a very, uh, you know, honorable part of their genteel society. Uh, so how do you feel about this? Do you feel that, that that's the right thing to do, to tear up these plantations and give it, give it all out to these slaves? Understand, very important here, understand this. What these people did, enslaving people before the Civil War ended and freed them, they did not break any law. There was no law against slavery. They weren't breaking the law. And if you abuse your slave and beat them, rape them, kill them, maim them, hang them, it didn't matter. That was your property. So even though they had done all those things, they were awful people, not in the eyes of the law. They hadn't broken a law. So do you feel like it's fair that this could be done, that they could take these plantations because you've done this immoral thing, we're going to take away your land? Uh, you know, again, being immoral is not against the law. Uh, so, of course, this was, this was very controversial at that time. But what happened is Johnson stepped in, of course, pro-Confederate, Southerner, and he allowed the ex-Confederates to get all their lands back, get their plantations back. This idea of divvying up these lands for the slaves ended. Uh, and the slaves had no opportunities to gain any of their own land at all. Uh, so without question, the lack of land available to former slaves left them with very little opportunity. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? How do we you know, make a living. We're just going to be beggars in the street here. We, we got to find some kind of economic opportunity to, to, you know, begin our lives as free people. Okay. So let's do our first supplemental lecture right here. So by now you should have seen the assignment instructions. That was part of your uh, class one, class two. Actually, I think it was part of class two of this module. I also have a module posted called assignment instructions that you can, you can refer to anytime that you'd like. All the assignments are there, including written instructions and a video tutorial for chapter quizzes, film reflections, discussion boards, and supplemental lectures, okay? So I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but because it's our first one, I'm just going to go over the main points of what we're doing here. So a supplemental lecture is separate from the main lecture. So what I would suggest you do right now, as you've been taking notes, Start a separate, whether it's a document or a piece of paper, however you write your notes, start a separate one called Supplemental Lecture Number One and, and keep these separate. And when I give this lecture, uh, take detailed notes so you know what I said. So you can later take those notes and write an essay about it. I'm also going to give you an outline. So here's the outline for our first one. This, this will be with every supplemental lecture that I give you. There's going to be 16 of these in our class, eight before the midterm eight before the final. So for the midterm, when, when you get to the, that section, it's actually part two of the midterm and final exam. Part one is a multiple choice exam. Part two are the essays. When you get to them, when you open them up, 
my, the list will be reduced to six. So out of the eight, I'm going to take two away, but you won't know which two I took away until you open it, okay? Uh, you then choose three to, to write about. And you can use your, your supplemental lecture notes and these outlines. And what I'm suggesting to you is write your paper exactly as the outline is given here. This is how I'm going to give you the lecture. I'm going to follow this outline verbatim. So a supplemental lecture, they all have three parts. Number one is the introduction, always a part. And then lastly at the bottom you see relevance. Those two are always there. And they're both worth three points each. So if you miss the intro or miss the relevance, you're going to lose three points each. So when I say intro, what am I saying in the intro? It created a cycle, plantation owners and free people. What am I saying about that? So in your intro, talk to me about this cycle and what was the relationship between plantation owners and free people. Anything between the introduction and the relevance uh, are the main points. So in this case, sharecropping grid and results are the main points. The relevance, number four, you see at the bottom is empty. I will give that to you at the end of the lecture. I will I will stay to you a couple times so you get it. I, I don't put it on the outline because I don't want it to be that easy. I want you to understand that you got to listen to these and get the relevance at the end. So write the relevance down. And if you'd like to uh, uh, present your relevance word for word in your essay, I will accept that. Um, not the rest of your essay. The, the rest of your essay needs to be in, in your words, but for the relevance, I'll accept it word for word. Sometimes if you put it in your own words, which of course I'd prefer, but sometimes people miss a point or two. So uh, it's, it's okay to write it word for word to ensure that you get it. Okay. So intro first, you know, it doesn't have to be five paragraphs. These are these are reviews. You're reviewing what I'm saying here. So just like a movie preview, I mentioned in the in the instructions, you know, a movie preview for a two-hour movie is three minutes. Uh, this is going to be a 10 to 15 minute lecture. So, you know, if somebody came to you and said, I really want to uh, hear this lecture, but I, I don't know what it's about. Do you know what it's about? That's, that's what I'm trying to get you to write. Write a review of what I said by following this outline. So introduction first, then then write about the uh, main points, which in this case, anything between the intro and the relevance is sharecropping and results. Uh, so whatever I say about those, write that down. Uh, I don't, you don't have to go into huge details. That's not a, what a review is. It's kind of an overview. But use your writing to connect all of these, because that's how the lecture is given to you. Okay, uh, it, the, 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 the lecture flows from start to finish. I'm going in, it, in an obvious direction. Uh, what I want you to do is try to get the feel of that lecture and put it down in an essay in review form, okay? Okay, so please listen to the video tutorial about supplemental lectures found in modules under assignment instructions. It's also found in week one of uh, class, I believe, two. Uh, again, that's part of your assignment this week. You should have already done that. If you haven't done that, uh, I would suggest you do that before you listen to this lecture and, and, and start, you know, with uh, your first supplemental lecture, just so you know exactly what is going on with these. Okay. Okay. So just briefly looking at at the uh, outline number one is the intro created a cycle. What kind of cycle? Plantation owners and free people. I'm going to ask you what was their relationship uh, as this war was over. Number two is the sharecropping grid, and that grid will have the six steps of sharecropping. So sharecropping is what this is about, obviously. What are the results of all this, and, and what does 75% represent? I'll make that very clear. And as always, like I said earlier, at the end of the lecture, I will state the relevance, okay? All right, I think we're ready to get started. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out, let me know, email me. Uh, come to my Zoom sessions on Wednesdays between noon and 2. Set up a private session with me. Whatever works for you, we can make it happen. But, but please don't let this get away from you. And then the midterms here, you don't know what's going on. Please, these aren't difficult. They're not complicated, but they're a little different. But they're, they're simple and the instructions are simple. But you got to follow the instructions verbatim. So please reach out if you don't understand what, what this is about. Okay? Let's get started. So what is this a picture of? Using the using the word the the game word association. What word comes to your mind when you see this? And most people say a slave or slavery. And of course you would think that. It's a black man. He's young. 
He's, he's wearing rags. He's in a field. It's hot. He's got an old style plow. I mean, this, this is pretty, you know, antiquated. This wouldn't be something you see today. Uh, although if you do go down in the Mississippi Delta, you might see this today. There's still people that live like this in our, in our modern times. Uh, but in fact, this is not a slave. This is a freed man. This is a sharecropper. So it kind of looks the same, right? We got our freedom. Now I'm free and look at me. I'm back in the field doing the same old job. Uh, so, so what is sharecropping and, and you know, how, how this happened? Uh, well, sharecropping was work for the former slave owners, but understand, and I mentioned this earlier in this in the part one, uh, sharecropping created a cycle of endless indebtedness. That's straight out of the outline. That's your first cue right there, okay? It created a cycle of endless indebtedness. So what was the relationship between plantation owners and freed people after this war? You used to be uh, my slave. Now you're free and you're gone. Now, but you don't have any opportunity because you have no skill. I don't have any workers, so I can't make money to run my plantation. So suddenly the two of us need each other. So because both had a need, they came back together. But instead of, you know, re-enslaving them, we're, we're going to come up with this, with this uh, idea called sharecropping. Uh, you know, we have plantations, but we have no labor. You're free people with no work. So amazingly, these two former adversaries, master and slave, who split apart after the war, of course they would, they come back together again because they really ended up needing each other. And this is where the, the concept of sharecropping was born. And on paper in the beginning, it, it was thought, wow, maybe this is the answer for everybody. It gives slaves, uh, ex-slaves the chance to work and make some money and start their lives with their families and have a piece of land. And it gives the plantation owners enough of an income to get back on their feet and pay their taxes that they're probably behind on. So on paper, originally, it looked like a good idea. But as we'll see, due to greed and corruption and, and an intense hatred, this will come undone. Uh, so this is the sharecropping grid, the six steps of sharecropping, the sharecropper cycle of poverty. So again, this sharecropping idea created a cycle of poverty for these ex-slaves, these freed people. So number one at the top, sharecropping, the sharecropper, the former slave, has provided land and seed to grow, whatever, whatever their crop would be, from the uh, land owner, perhaps their former master, in exchange the sharecropper promises the landowner half the crop. Uh, they don't have any money to pay rent. So instead of paying me money for rent, give me half your crop and I can sell that and that's good enough for me. Okay, sounds good. I mean, half is better than nothing, right? So the sharecropper then says, but you know, I don't have any food, clothing, medicine, blankets, you know, cups, uh, silverware. You know, I don't have anything. I I'm a slave, so I need to get that. So the, the owner, the plantation owner says, you can buy food and clothing on credit from me, whether it's from his own store or from himself. I'll lend you the money, you go get what you want, and then when the crop comes in and we're both paid, you can pay me back. <clears throat> okay, sounds pretty good. Uh, the sharecropper realizes once we buy all these supplies, we won't have to buy these every year, so next year we'll make more money. That's okay, so we're on our way. Number three, the sharecropper plants and harvests his, his crop, and it's all going really well. Number four, uh, now he's harvested the crop and he's got it all ready to go to market, so he gives the landowner his entire crop. The landowner will now take the entire crop to market, sell it, and come back and give the, the sharecropper half the uh, price of what he got of course, minus the cost of his purchases of the year from step two, okay? So it sounds pretty good. I mean, just, just for numbers, and these aren't real numbers of that era, but just, just to illustrate, and for an example, uh, let's just say that the, the entire crop was worth $1,000. So the, so the landowner takes that crop, gets $1,000 for it. He now comes back with cash, and here's the sharecropper waiting for his portion. I owe you $500, that's half, but you spent $200 in supplies. 
So I'm going to take that off in, in step two. I'm going to take that off. I, I owe you three. And of course, the sharecropper's plea, heck yeah, I'll take $300. I don't, I've never had three cents, so 300 bucks is a lot. I can get my life going. I can improve my, my home, get better clothes for my wife and kids, and get them in school, and, and, and you know all those types of things. He's, he's pretty excited. Number five is where it starts to go south and where the greed and, and hatred comes in. When settling up, the landowner says that the sharecropper actually owes money uh, and that you haven't really earned anything. So, so where does this come from? Well, the, the, the landowner says, you borrowed uh, from step two, and I'm charging you interest on what you borrowed. Very high interest that would be illegal today. Uh, of course, the, the, the sharecropper doesn't know what interest is. They've never been to school. They don't understand percentages. They don't know math. They don't understand you know, paying somebody interest on borrowed money. So they're scratching their head, as you see in step five. Uh, instead of owing you 300 bucks, the, the interest is 400 that you owe me. So I don't owe you $300. You owe me $100. So the sharecropper has gone through the entire season, has done what he's been told, but at the end, he finds himself actually in debt. Okay. Uh, number six, to pay this debt, the sharecropper must promise the landowner a greater share of next year's crop. So instead of having more money because you don't have to buy supplies and, and getting ahead, they're getting behind. So this is the cycle of poverty. This, these six steps continue year after year after year after year, uh, generation after generation, and these people never get ahead. And they are always in debt and always having to work off their debt to the landowner. So to wrap this grid up in the middle here, by the time sharecroppers had shared their crops and paid their debts, including the interest, they rarely had any money left, and I would say they never had any money left. Often they were uneducated, not often, in every case they were uneducated. They were former slaves. They could not argue with landowners or merchants who cheated them. They didn't understand math and percentage and all that. A sharecropper frequently became tied to one plantation, having no choice but to work until his debts were paid. Okay? Uh, so, you know, this is an interesting uh, idea. Uh, this is the cycle of poverty. So by, um, now there were advantages of sharecropping for both. For slaves, they had access to land that they couldn't get before. They could live as a family. For the owner, the cost of managing slaves, food, water, shelter, clothing, that was the sharecropper's responsibility now. And the owner also had access to crops that, that they did not have to man, uh, manage. Okay. What about disadvantages? For slaves, it was, it was a return to the drudgery of slavery. They're back in the field. They were in constant debt, a cycle of poverty. There was a lack of community. You know, they were separated. When they were slaves, they were all together and they had a community. Now they're all separated on pieces of land. For the owner, they did not make the same amount of money as before the war because half the crops were lost to the, to the sharecropper. Uh, so by... by um, by 1890, so, so 25 years after a war was fought to free them, three out of four former slaves were now sharecroppers. That's our 75% from the outline. 75% of former slaves were sharecroppers by 1890. Back in the same fields, working for the same master, looking like and working like slaves. Uh, this is out of your book. Sharecropping was an efficient method to raise cotton and for former plantation owners to export the freed slaves because the lash of indebtedness was always on their back. So not a real live lash with a whipping like they might have got as a slave, but it stings still the same. You know, going into debt and being under debt is a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, so, of course, some families, as we speak, are still on the same land today that their ancestors were as slaves on the same plantation lands generation after generation unable to break away from the oppressive cycle so of course Ladanian Tomlinson and his family are an example of this so I've used him for two two examples here taking the slave name as your last name and being stuck on the land uh, even though he broke away and became, you know, a wealthy football player. 
Uh, if, if he hadn't done that, if he didn't have athletic ability, he'd still be in Texas working really hard trying to stay ahead of all this. But his family has never left that plantation land. They're still there. How many years ago was the Civil War fought? And they were there for generations before that. So probably at least a couple hundred years. But Danny and Thomas's family has been on that plantation land even as we speak today. Okay. Uh, so, you know, an example, you can begin to understand, you know, why we still have racism and discrimination in this country. You know, these people were not given access to opportunity that, that I talked about in the intro lecture. They were, they were denied access to their constitutional rights, and, and 18 presidents didn't help them. Uh, so at this point in American history, we are over 200 years into it. Uh, and it was over 150 years ago. Uh, so you can, you can begin to see why we are still dealing with this and, and why people are still fighting in the streets. So, so race, like I said, is the common thread throughout all of American history, even today. Okay, uh, now I, I will give you the relevance of the lecture to wrap it up. So again, relevance is always last. If you want to write it word for word, you can, but, but nothing else can be word for word. Here's the relevance. Sharecropping is an example of how former slaves remain tied to the land they had been enslaved on for generations. Ladanian Thomas's family is an example of that. One more time. Sharecropping is an example of how former slaves remain tied to the land they had been enslaved on for generations. L. Uh, Ladanian Thomason is an example of that. Okay, so that is the end of supplemental lecture number one. So now go back to your main notes and we'll finish up this lecture. So I would I would definitely suggest to you to keep these supplemental lectures separate so you can extract them and use them when you write your essays. You can't use any other notes or anything else when you do that. Just your supplemental lecture notes and your outlines. Okay. Again, if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Okay, let's move on with the rest of this uh, chapter. So back to Reconstruction. So what happened to Reconstruction? I, I've said it's failed, but, but how did it fail? And what were the consequences? Where did it go wrong? Well, you know, initially it worked out pretty well. There was a period right after the war during the early Reconstruction era when blacks could vote and black officials were elected for the first time. And you here you see the title of this image here, the first colored senator and representative. So a, a black man was actually elected to the Senate. So it was working out pretty well. Uh, black communities were, were growing, uh, usually built around a central church. They created schools, newspapers. You know, they integrated themselves into a productive community, although always separate from white communities. <clears throat> So it's going pretty well, but slowly at first, then, then quicker, the ex-Confederates regain control of the South. And, you know, how they do that? Well, by implementing a second kind of slavery for the freed blacks, exploited through sharecropping, and legally segregated, kept apart, separated from white society. Uh, the... The ex-Confederates, the white supremacists in the South, they did not accept these Republican governments. They wanted to reestablish a society like they had before the war. They weren't willing to take on all, all, the, all these ideas of freedom. Uh, even a even hundred years after the Civil War, interracial marriages were against the law in most states. When, when I was young, when I was a, just, a, a, say, pre-teenager, pre it was against the law in most states to for a black and a white to marry. Uh, most certainly in all the southern states. That was finally struck down by the Supreme Court, but it was 100 years later. So it was all about separating them and keeping them apart and not mixing. The, the white communities did not want to mix with the, with the freed people at all. Keep If they're going to be freed, keep them over there away from us. Uh, Okay, um, so slowly the white Southerners are are regaining control. Okay, and and we have this uh, you know racism reigns supreme, uh, uh, 
and, but we've come a long way since those days, right? We, I mean, we certainly have. But but all of us could uh, tell a a a ugly, grisly, racist story. It doesn't really matter what color you are. Uh, I realize that it, it affects people differently depending on what color you are. But all of us have experiences in our lifetime. There's there's still some pretty big remnants of race racism out there. And again, if we have the time or the ability, I bet everyone could tell a, a story about their own story. I'm going to share a couple with you quickly. Uh, when I was just out of high school, this would be the mid 70s. I got a job at a market in the town that I grew up in. Uh, and, you know, I, I did pretty well there and, and became part of the management team about a year in. So I was being trained to do a lot of things, including interview people. Uh, so the, the the manager that I worked for his his name was Nolan, and he was a great guy, one of the one of the nicest men I've ever known. Uh, he was training me how to interview people. It was a very popular market; and everybody wanted to work there. So there were people coming in to interview every day. Uh, so he said, "Here's the application. You know, ask them these questions and blah blah blah, and you know, write some notes if you're impressed or not impressed, whatever it might be." But if a black person walks in, okay, I want you to put a little N on the top right corner of the of the front page of the application. If anybody asks what that N means, it means Nolan. Okay, but that's not what it meant at all. It was a way for Nolan to identify that that this person was a black person by putting N meaning N word. Okay. So of course I was in complete shock. Even though I was very, I was probably 18 years old. I had grown up in this town that was all white. And we were all taught to be fearful of anybody of color and that they were evil and, and stay away from them. I, I was taught, I was brought up that way. But of course, by 18, you're starting to, you know, enlighten and look around and wait a minute, maybe there's a different world out there. And I'm starting to feel this. You know, I grew up in the 60s. I, I saw a lot of stuff happen that changed my point of view from what I was taught to, to be by my parents in schools that I went to. So I was I was appalled by this. But of course, you're 18. Uh, I don't want to lose my job. And I kind of, oh, oh, okay. But I was shocked that he would be that bold to tell me as an employee, I want you to use racism to keep black people from working here. It was, it was phenomenal to me um, that he would go that far. That's the town I grew up in. That was acceptable behavior. Everybody would applaud him for that. Uh, the other story I, I, I knew, uh, actually, my best friend uh, that I've spent a lot of time with, uh, he was Italian, and his parents would entertain at a large extended family. They would have these huge parties, bocce ball and all this kind of fun stuff, pool parties. It was really fun. And I'd go to his, they had a big house. I'd go there a lot to, to you know, have fun. Uh, so I got to know his family really well. His younger sister uh, was while she was in high school, was her boyfriend also in high school was a, uh, you know, a, a young man who wanted to be a police officer. That's all he wanted to do. He wanted to be a police officer in that town, in that town I grew up in. Uh, so of course we, you know, everybody knew that that that's what he was. They were going to get married out of high school, and he was going to be a cop, and and there you go. Uh, so um, you know, as the years went by. I saw less and less of the of the of the guy that became a cop, but I'd see him once in a while, and I saw that he he got the job. It, it was kind of funny when he first got the he he, he was first an explorer. You're not you're not a real cop. You don't carry a gun. You haven't gone to the academy, but you're able to be part of the you know department. You have a car. You can drive around. You can give parking tickets, but you can't pull anybody over until you're a full fledged cop. So he would go around and give people tickets for having for sale signs in their window for their car. So that's that's one of those lies that probably is not enforced very much, kind of like spitting on the sidewalk or jaywalking. Not that you 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 couldn't get you know stopped for that, but typically not. But it, it is against the law to have a for sale sign in your in your car window. Why? Because if a, if a person is driving their car and they're driving by and they see your for sale sign. While they're reading that sign, they might crash. So it, it takes away their focus from driving. But of course, it's one of those lies that nobody enforces. But 
but but this young man did he he would go around and give out 20 tickets every day for, for sale sign he thought that was pretty cool so an indication of what kind of personality he has and as the years went by he became a full-fledged police officer and, and started to climb the ranks in that department so probably yeah i don't know five or six years later perhaps the early mid 80s I went to a party at my friend's house and there he was. Now he's a full-fledged police officer and doing quite well. So I went up to talk to him. There was a group of us and, you know, so how's it like being a cop? And, you know, what's it like? Are you happy? And he said, oh, I love this job. This is the best thing ever. And, you know, it's it's nice to be part of the department where I grew up. I can protect my city. And, yeah, that's nice. And he said, I, and I want you to all know that you don't have any 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 reason to fear you know we'll take care we're going to protect this town like what do, you, what do you mean by that he said well there's there's not a lot going on it's a small town uh you know most of the time we're just patrolling waiting for something to happen so what we do all of us and, the, and that entire department was made up of young white men that typically went to high school in that town i knew all of them which is kind of a good thing to, to, to have by the way when you're that young to know all the police officers in town i knew all of them they all have the same point of view. We're going to patrol the town. And we're going to keep people of color out of it. So if, if, a, if a car full of Hispanics or blacks come into the city limits, we're going to pull them over under some false pretense. If we can arrest them, we will. Uh, at, at the least, we're going to tell them to leave. Get out of here. You're not welcome here. And this is completely against the law. This is not, you know, uh, 1840 Alabama. This is, you know, 1980s United States. All that kind of stuff's behind us, but there's still remnants of it. You still feel it. Uh, so he said, if we can arrest them and put them in jail, we'll do that. You know, even, even you know, uh, come up with some kind of, you know, charge to, to charge against them. So, of course, this whole idea of, of driving while black, driving while Hispanic, you know, people, uh, people especially men of color, are you know, worried about being pulled over by white police officers. Of course, we still see this in our present day today, police shootings, okay? So, of course, I kind of spoke up. You know, I was older, too. I wasn't 18 anymore. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, did, did you just say that? Like, you can't have, you can't say that. That's against the law. This is discrimination, man. Like, what is the matter with you? And we had words, and he was angry. And um, some other people got angry at me for getting in his face. But come on, bro, you can't, you can't spread this kind of hate. Uh, this this is what's what's wrong with this country. You're what's wrong with this country. So I'm only saying that just to give you a couple examples. But what's interesting about this story about this man today, as we speak, that man is the chief of police in that town. So I, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. All these years later, it's been more than 20. He's pushing 30 years that I've probably seen him. Although I have seen him rise in the ranks. I don't I haven't lived there for years, but I have friends there and people tell me he's rising in the ranks. Now he's chief of police. But I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt because I know what education did for me. You know, it enlightens you and takes away some of the the harsh edges about your point of view. I don't think you can become the chief of police without a, a degree and probably a master's degree at least. So so the process of getting a bachelor's and a master's, I'm hoping you know, took away this hate and this, and this racism from him, from him. And perhaps today he's a better man than he was back then. I don't know because I haven't talked to him. But again, this is an example of how racism permeates generation after generation. You know, 30, 40 years later, these racist comments made all those years ago are still relevant today because he's the chief of police, okay? So, like I said, if we had the time and the ability, I'm sure every one of you could tell us a story similar, whether you're white or non-white. Of course, the non-white uh, stories would probably have, you know, much more tragicness to it and sadness to it. Because I'm sure what you've experienced is a lot worse than what I experienced. But we all got to deal with it. We all kind of drown in it. We all got to figure it out. And, and we struggle as, as a country to do that. Okay, so back to our era. So the... 1875, the Radical Republicans passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875. This guaranteed African Americans equal treatment in public accommodations, public transportation. Uh, it prohibited them being excluded from jury service and, in fact, gave them transportation and public accommodations to become a juror. 
So what's significant about this? Well, well, like the Enforcement Act of 1870 I talked about in the first part of this chapter, uh, it didn't really do anything because nobody enforced it, so the South circumvented it and got around it. They continued to oppress and discriminate and torture and murder black people to keep them from voting and to keep them from rising and gaining power. And they would do this for nearly 100 years. So why didn't anybody stop them? Again, it's a built-in systemic racism. Eighteen presidents didn't speak up. Franklin Roosevelt, known as a liberal and a president that gave African Americans opportunities. Uh, he himself, this is in the 1930s and 40s, he himself refused to sign uh, a law that banned lynching. So, I mean, what is lynching? It's murder. So murder's against the law, no matter what. So why would a president have to sign legislation to ban lynching? Isn't it already banned as murder? But lynching was seen as a sport in the South post-Civil War, all the way up, in, up into the 20th century. Uh, in fact, if you, if you search lynching on, on uh, Google, you'll see pretty ugly images, but many of them have crowds of people around the person that got lynched and they're happy and smiling typically well always white people but many times you see the young sons with their fathers and they're all very proud to be part of of the murder of this black man but the, but president roosevelt would not sign that bill because he was afraid it would anger the people in the south and he'd lose their votes so that's what i'm talking about that's one example of uh, of 18 presidents that just completely ignore these people and and do not fight or defend their their rights. So so what happened to Reconstruction? Well, you know, what happened initially was a panic of 1873, an economic depression. This severely curtailed the Republicans' plans for Reconstruction. Uh, federal support in the South dried up. You need money to reconstruct, and now you've got this depression, and there's no money. Uh, so the federal support they didn't have any, uh, and the economy died uh, and of course you know it, th those are tough times you can have you can have all the the best ideas in mind that you want to implement but when times get hard and you can't pay your mortgage if you can't pay your car payment and 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 you lose your home and, and you and your kids are homeless you're not going to care about what slaves and ex-slaves in the south are doing if you're in the north it's survival of your own and you, you focus on you and not them. So the entire North kind of turns away from the South and away from the plight of the free people and start to figure out ways to figure out their own problems. When you have a depression like this, many times the government kind of becomes very hands-off. It's called laissez-faire, leave business to themselves. You don't really oversee, you just kind of let it, let it kind of go because you got too many things going on. Uh, you know, the, the government of this era was, was very corrupt. And I'm talking about Ulysses S. Grant's administration. Uh, his administration was, was perhaps the most corrupt in American history and drowning in scandals. So interesting idea that Grant's administration was the most corrupt or one of the most corrupt. This was a hero of the Civil War, but now his administration is corrupt. It's been determined that Grant himself may not have been so corrupt, but his administration certainly was. And one of those scandals was the Credit uh, Mobilier scandal, uh, where the you're talking about government contracts to build the railroad, and this Credit Mobilier was going to do the, the construction. But they would charge twice the actual costs of the project, and the government would pay it, and they'd put that money in their pocket. Uh, and after it was after it was discovered, they tried they tried to bribe Congress, and this is an ugly situation, uh, the biggest bribery scandal in U.S. history. Uh, why am I bringing this up? Because the the government's focused on this in the North, and they just don't care about the South. That people are being lynched and harassed and, and violated and, and and kept from their rights. Um, Again, people don't care about social programs when they're on survival. How do I feed my family? That's more important to them. Uh, so because of all this and the fact that more than 10 years had gone by since the, since the Civil War ended, 
the Northerners especially were tired of Reconstruction and wanted to move on from the Civil War era. Let's move on. I'm tired of the Civil War. It's been going on for so long. By turning their back, this allowed the Southerners to further regain even more control and reinstitute white supremacy. They passed illegal black codes to hold blacks back from gaining the society and return them to the fields. And again, all illegal and nobody stopped them. One of the ways that they would uh, keep blacks from voting besides intimidation was that you, you had poll tax, or let, let's start with, with a literacy test. So if you were black, you had to pass a test to vote. Now there's nowhere in the constitution that says you have to pass a test to vote. If you're a citizen and you are of age, it doesn't matter if you're unemployed or, or whatever it is, any citizen can vote. You don't, you don't have to be a certain strata of people to do that. Anybody can vote if you're of age. But now they say, no, black, of course, only men, not women. They weren't given the right. Black men have to pass this literacy test first. So, you know, you and I could take this test. It would probably take us a while. As you see here, that's number 23 at the bottom. I don't know how many pages this was. Um, this is all really just logic and <clears throat> just figuring it out. But understand, you know, these, these ex-slaves, they, they didn't have any education. And education and learning math teaches you logic, uh, but they had never had that before. So just for an example, let's look at number 15 here. In the space below, write the word noise backwards and place a dot over what would be its second letter should it have been written forward. Okay, so, you know, it's not like it's out of control hard, but, you know, you, you might struggle with this if you've never done it before. Uh, you could figure it out, but imagine how long it would take a, a person with no education at all. And I'm talking about zero, not, not just a lack of zero education. They've never seen this before in their lives. Um, how long would it take them to get through this exam? Uh, against the law, uh, they would also have poll taxes where it would actually cost black men money to vote, not white men, black men. If you were black and you managed to get to the voting booth, without your house getting burned down or yourself lynched, if you, if you got there, now you got to pay them money. Well, these were ex-slaves. They don't have any money. They've never had any money. So they, they, of course, can't come up with the money to pay for it. They also had what was called the grandfather clause. If your grandfather was a free man, then you could vote. Well, of course, if you're a freed slave, your grandfather is probably a slave. So all of these restrictions were implemented in the South to keep black men from voting completely against the law, completely unconstitutional and against every fabric of, of America post-Civil War. Don't forget our Reconstruction Amendments and the rights afforded to people from them, but yet nobody stopped them. The South got around it, they pushed their own agenda through, and the Constitution was thrown in the trash, and the presidents looked the other way, and this went on for decades and not one president stopped it okay uh you also have as the north turns their back and and stops paying attention in the south the kkk rises even further uh the north's not paying attention they got their economic downturn and they've, they've also got a disinterest in the south or tired of the civil war so the kkk rose to more prominence the kkk became the heroes of white southerners and they represented the, the, the honorable white soldier that, 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 that lost in the war but never lost their honor. And the KKK intimidate free blacks from voting, scare them. Uh, they also try to overthrow what in their minds were Republican Reconstructionist governments. And nobody stopped them. So they, took, they retook control and they returned it to one that was based on white supremacy. And then the rotten cherry on top of it all was the election of 1876, tainted with controversy regarding the electoral votes tally. And this, this came down to what was called the Compromise of 1877. So Rutherford B. Hayes, the man that you see right here, he becomes the president. Uh, the Democrats, he's a Republican. He's a white Republican from the North. The Democrats allow it because as a concession for being elected, Hayes says, I'll pull all the troops out of the South and Reconstruction will be over. What will that lead to? It, it, will, re, it will lead to or result in 
Southern redemption. The white Southerners will, will regain control of the South. So this happens in white supremacy and home rule is restored, of course, at the, uh, you know, uh, uh, negative of the slaves, the ex-slaves, the, the freed people. They're not going to get any consideration now. Uh, so things are worse. Uh, so in this election, the Democrats conceded the election to Hayes uh, in return for an end to Reconstruction and the withdrawal of federal troops from the South. Uh, so, you know, corrupt, uh, in incredibly corrupt. Uh, Hayes got the electoral votes from three states that had not re-entered the Union yet. He got 20 votes that he didn't even earn, and he won the election by, I think, one vote, one electoral vote. So, yeah, this, this is about as corrupt as you can get when it comes to elections. Let's watch a short film about this uh, election. Please watch the film, The American Presidential Election of 1876, and then come on back. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, you know, awful moment, shameful. Uh, and what this resulted in is that is the North pulled out of the South, leaving the freed people uh, to attempt to create their own defense in fighting the now emboldened Southerners who wanted their culture back desperately. And these people were intent on reoppressing a race of people who seemingly had gained their freedom. And they also gained the same constitutional rights as anybody else. But it was not meant to be. The Southerners reasserted their illegal, illegal control of these people for 100 more years. So, so Reconstruction's over, and it's an absolute failure. This was a disaster. It was not a good era at all. Uh, the failure of Reconstruction was caused by violence that crushed black aspirations and the abandonment by Northern whites of Southern Republicans. So the abandonment by Northern whites, I mentioned that, but who were Southern Republicans? I mean, the Republican Party was a Northern party. It's the reason why the Civil War started. The South refused to have a Republican president or, or, or refused to be under a, a Republican president. So who's a Southern Republican? Well, they're black people. They're freed slaves because they joined the party of Lincoln. They're emancipated. So the Northern whites abandoned them and left them to, to their own devices. And the South was left in the hands of the former slave owners and for more than 90 more years fell back into society based on racism, discrimination, and oppression. Mm -hmm. Under Jim Crow, black people, former slaves, were relegated to the status of second-class citizens. Jim Crow represented the legitimization of anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. Christian, white Christian ministers taught that whites were the chosen people and that blacks were cursed by God to be servants and that God himself supported racial segregation. Public school systems in the South taught the idea that the Old South was about honor and chivalry. A noble people brought down by the, by the barbarians from the North. And they tried to minimize slavery as a benign institution that was good for their loyal slaves. And there are still schools and textbooks in the South today that still push this ideal. Uh, so, of course, these people are breaking many laws, and they're ignoring the three Reconstruction Amendments, but nobody enforced them. So the former Confederate white Southerners retook control of the South, and it was put back in the same shape it had been before the slaves were freed, just not legally enslaved anymore, but it was pretty much the same. Uh, black people in the South continued to be oppressed until 1964, with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. And then in 1965, the passage of the Voting Rights Act. So in the past, I mentioned 18 presidents. This, this is where it stops. Lyndon Johnson would be the first president to enforce these, these laws in the South. And what's important about this slide is the bottom paragraph. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 authorized the Attorney General of the United States to send federal examiners to register qualified voters by bypassing local officials who try to keep blacks from voting. So, of course, you can look at the at the um, you know the the uh, numbers of registered black voters. If there's a county in the South that has fewer or no black voters, they're going to come down there to see. And when it says bypassing local officials, 
that's the KKK. You, you've got to get around because they're going to do everything they can to keep them from voting. So the government finally gets involved and starts to enforce these laws in 1965 when I was nine years old. <clears throat> I'm just pointing that out because I'm not, I'm still here. It wasn't that long ago. Okay. Uh, so you could argue that African Americans in the United States today have only had access to their constitutional rights as afforded them in the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, just since 1965. So that is, you know, uh, 50 something plus years ago. That's all just a little over a generation. So, you know, has it been equal footing? No, they're, they're, they're behind because they haven't been given access to it until, until very recently. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, okay. Okay, so the civil rights movement that was synonymous with the 1960s was born from the fight, this fight, and this was the result of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, very integral, uh, Malcolm X, uh, Medgar Evers, and so on. These men were integral in getting these pieces of legislation passed that finally changed the typical African American's life. Uh, so the civil rights movement in the 60s was to try to get these constitutional rights to black people that the Civil War era gave them, you know, 99, 100 years earlier, uh, but not until 1965 did they finally get it. So it's, it's a very easy question to ask once you hear the story, who really won the Civil War? Uh, you know, the, the, the North won it on the battlefield without question. They defeated the South. The, the armies were defeated. Mm. Uh, but but what did it result in? The, sla the, the freed slaves weren't really freed. Uh, you have the injustices of the Reconstruction era, uh, you know, the, the reoppressing of people, sharecropping, and, and all this kind of stuff. So again, why do we study history? Because most Americans don't know this. Should they know this? Yes, because the, the, the conflicts in the street today are all born from this era. Lincoln was killed and his approach went with him. And America's direction took a, a hard right turn, went a different way. And it was Andrew Johnson taking it down a racist, hateful path. And we're still paying for it. So if we all understand this and go and, and learn it and, and uh, you know, absorb it, we, we can start to feel different about people. These African-American people that were freed are American citizens too, just like everybody else, just like we are today. But they haven't been afforded uh, their, their access to it until very recently. Uh, so truly, the injustices of the Reconstruction era resulted in the birth of the modern civil rights movement. But, you know, in closing, don't forget, I mentioned it a minute ago, but it's very important to understand this. Uh, a huge factor in this disgrace, shameful moment in American history is that Lincoln was gone, murdered, and with him went his kind, forgiving, and benevolent approach. Okay, that is the end of, ch of chapter 15. Thank you.